the top 7% of traders take less than three trades in a trading session. Everybody's focused on the charts. It's all bullshit. If you don't have rules in place, you, you're gonna get burnt. So I don't trade on sentiment. Okay. Most people brokers are a scam. Go to the bookstore, get economics for dummies. What is NFP? What is it? Fucking teddy bears. No grown man should be touching oh. teddy bears. Anyway, welcome back guys. Thank you for joining us for another episode of On The Couch. We must be doing something right because we're getting such great engagement. Lots of comments coming in and we're going to be asking some of those questions on today's show. Welcome back, babe. You, you're a gold trader. Mm -hmm. Okay. When people come up to you and ask you about gold, you ask them a series of questions. So what are those questions and why do you ask them those questions? Well, I actually ask anybody who says they're a trader. I usually ask them, what, what do you trade? Um, I love it when they trade gold because it's something that I'm familiar with, so I can always drill them on the, the numbers a bit. But it doesn't matter what, what the person's trading. I will usually ask them what they trade. And then if they tell me they're trading NAS 30 or NAS 100 or they're trading gold, I'll ask them a fundamental set of questions. What are the companies that make up the NAS 30? How many companies are in there? Um, what is the market cap of the top 10 companies? If you're trading gold, what is the tonnage of gold right now above ground? And what is the forecast for it being for production next year? How much gold was there above ground last year? And most traders cannot answer those basic questions. And what that tells me is that these are people who have simply learned how to read charts, mm. do technical analysis, but have no idea of what they're investing into. And the example I always give is if you go and buy a car, you know the brand that you're going for, you know how many seats it's got, you've got, you know, what size the engine is, you know what fuel type it takes, guys know how many exhaust pipes it's got. But yet when it comes to putting money into Forex, most traders don't have any idea of the fundamental thing that they're putting their money into. They're putting their money into the charts. So they're not actually understanding the fundamentals behind it. So you know, if I say to somebody, you're an index trader, you better study every company on that index. You better know what the collective market cap is. You must know beyond the big news events like CPI, PPI, NFP, besides those big events, what are the other economic events that drives fluctuations in price on those indexes? What are the fundamental elements that, that the value is driven by on those, on those assets? And so you now when people come and talk to me, I'm yet to have one person who actually understands the fundamentals. Most people have been taught only technical trading and that's where the problem is. So if you had to sum it up in very simple, quick points, yep. what would be the factors that uh, affect the gold price mainly? Everything bad in the world, good for gold. Okay. So when everything is going to crap in the world, gold is seen as a safe haven. It's where people go to put their money when they're worried about what's happening in the real world. That's why it's referred to as God's money. Mm. They can't print more of it. There's only so much in that's above ground at the moment. Production's getting harder and harder to go and mine it. We've got to go deeper for it. So the fundamental rule behind gold, fundamental number one rule, is if there is chaos in the world, if somebody's dropping a bomb on someone, it's going to push the gold price up. If there is, you know, a major world war breaks up, the f breaks out, the first thing I'm doing is buying gold. Okay. There are other factors many many other factors but that is the one cardinal rule everything going to shit in the world good for gold okay. right then on the other side of things because we trade uh, gold versus us dollar you could also trade gold versus the australian dollar and a couple of other currency pairs which i don't recommend i trade gold us dollar if the dollar is doing really well for some reason the dollar is really strengthening that could be bad for gold because what it means is that basically people would rather put their money into the dollar, which is going to generate interest because gold is a non-interest bearing asset. So you don't get interest off it. The only way you make money of gold is the price of gold going up. Okay. And so generally speaking, uh, those are the two factors that I pay attention to. And then the third factor that I pay very close attention to is what are the central banks doing on their buying policies around gold? So if we know that China has got a very aggressive buying policy on gold, it's goes hand in hand with the gold price that's going to keep going up. 
if we see that, for example, the US and China are pulling back on the amount of gold that they're buying and they're just going to sit on reserves, that might indicate that the gold price is going to come down a bit. So there's some very clear indicators on how to trade gold from a fundamental perspective. Now, leading from that... I wish I, I, wish I knew this at, on 9-11. Because the moment, <laughs> the moment those, I would have made a lot of money. The moment those planes flew into, into the towers, I would have gone straight and bought gold. You want to be the most successful trader in the world, correct? Okay, that means that you would have had to study or are currently studying the most successful traders mm -hmm. to beat them. Yep. So how has your trading mentality or your trading methodology changed before studying them versus after studying them yeah so i've i've looked at i've been looking at the data sets of the top 100 traders in the world i've been studying them very closely i've been studying uh, the top one percent of traders across all funded traders on the top 17 prop firms in the world and i've been looking through the data set and that data set is definitely helping me become a better trader so some of the things that i am currently working on and things that i know i need to improve upon to get myself into that top echelon of traders. I've got to learn to be a bit more patient with holding my winning trades. I've, I've, I like to get in on a trade quickly and get out on a trade quickly, but often I, I, I lose a lot of opportunity on, on the upside of the movements or the downside of the movements. And I'm learning to hold my trades a little bit longer. Uh, the other thing is also focusing more attention on taking fewer trades and taking better trades, that's a big one. I mean, the top 7% the top of traders take less than three trades in a trading session. So the data is very clear. I mean, if you just look at that subsect of people who are very successful, there's a lot of stuff that they're all doing that is very similar. Mm. Uh, the other big one, which goes very much in line with how I trade, is only trading one, one pair. So you find that the most successful traders don't trade multiple things. They don't trade like an index here and a currency pair there and gold. They, they stick to one thing. So my thing is gold and I trade only gold. And then the other thing that I've also learned, and I think this is something that I'm also getting a lot of feedback on the private equity that I'm trading. It's a large financial institution. Their analysts look at my data. Uh, they look at my trades and they give me feedback all the time. And one of the things that I can definitely improve on the same trade, it's just how to make more money out of the same trade, is basically not to, not to be in losing trades for as long and also not to let my drawdowns be, be greater than half of what my wins are. And if you focus on, and this is what the top traders are doing, if you focus on your winning trades being at least double your losing trades on average, in terms of not the win rate, but the amount won. So like, two dollars mm. win versus one dollar lost mm. um and you and you pair that with an 80 percent win rate that automatically catapults you into that sort of top five six percent of traders in the world so that's something that i'm really really focusing on and then i'd say the other thing that i'm spending a lot of time on which i've looked at the data set is just being a lot more patient with my trades whether it's going in on entry being more patient on the entry whether it's whilst in the trade being more patient or whilst it's perhaps sometimes allowing my drawdowns to run where they need to run to, because often that is part of part of the trade. It has to retrace for it to go in, 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 the, in the direction that you, you want it to go into. So I think patience is probably a big one that I'm learning as well. Do you feel like um, the most successful traders are also journaling? Because I know you journal and you, you reflect on your trades. Well, it's not something that I can see in the data set. So it's, it's not something that I can intrinsically prove right but i mean in in following a lot of a lot of the top traders i suspect that journaling is part of it because the only way you get to improve your trades incrementally over time is you have to reflect back on those trades you've got to reflect back on every trade why did you tra take the trade what can you do better and most importantly why did you take the trade what was the what was the fundamental elements driving you what were the technical elements elements driving you and what were the emotional elements driving you because all of those things play into why you take a trade so i can't say for certainty that they are journaling mm. um, but i would highly suspect they are because the only way to, to improve something is you have to track it measure it and 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 thereby increase its its, its performance and have you had a significant loss or win that has taught you something i've had a lot of 
losses that I really regret. Not monetarily, but just because I let myself down. So great examples of the last podcast we did. I was so angry with myself. Mm. We, we actually recorded a video here and a lot, of, a lot of people didn't understand my anger behind it. They thought I was angry about losing. I wasn't angry about losing. I was angry that I took the trades. Mm. And one of my rules that I, that I didn't pay attention to was, you know, and I didn't obey my rule, is don't trade whilst distracted. So like today we're doing the podcast. I made sure I was done trading at you know 10 o'clock i was out of the market i was ready for the podcast and so there are a couple of trades that i've taken where i still need to exercise a lot more emotional control uh, i need to have a lot more emotional intelligence and patience when taking trades but generally speaking i can say this with confidence especially over the last two months i'm finding myself becoming more and more emotionally stable when it comes to taking trades and I think that is a direct reflection of the work that I'm putting in the journaling. Hmm. Uh, that, is, that is work off the charts. It's work in the journaling. Um, and so I'm finding, I'm finding a lot of emotional stability through trading. Hmm. I have seen that, by the way. Here's the interesting thing, and I think this is the other thing that's a personal strategy of mine. I don't know if it's something that the top traders apply, but it's something I'm applying. As my capital base is growing, I'm actually taking less and less risk to make the same amount of money. So if I stayed on the same risk, I'd be making a lot more money. But my objective is to make trading as risk-free as possible for myself. So, you know, as my capital base grows, I mean, if I double my capital base and I stayed on the same risk exposure, I should be making double the money. But essentially what I'm doing is I'm, exp I'm, I'm reducing my risk exposure by half. So I'm actually halving my lot sizes as I go in. And so consequently, I'm making the same amount of money, but with so much less risk. And I think that's something else that's playing into my emotional stability is that when I take these trades, I've got so much confidence in the trades, but even if the trades don't work out, it's not hurting me. And so there's less emotion in it for me because every dollar isn't that important, if that makes mm. sense. Do you have any core beliefs about the market? I definitely have a lot. Um, a, a lot of them are very controversial. I think one of the biggest mistakes in Forex trading is that everybody's focused on the charts, right? And everybody's focused on looking at time frames and doing time frame analysis and doing, you know, candle analysis and looking at trend lines and support and resistance. I'm almost at a point now where I almost don't even look at the charts when I take a trade. I, I will look at it for a better point of entry. But I know by half past three in the morning, when I've woken up and I've read couple of news items on my phone, scanned a couple of fundamental headlines, had a look at some of the economic data that I'm tracking. I kind of have already developed my bias for the day on which way the market is going. And even if I don't find the perfect entry, mm. as long as I'm in the right direction, my trade is going to work out. And so the way I'm so accurate and the, the guys in the money tribe who are following my market analysis every morning are completely gobsmacked by how accurate my market analysis is every morning. I mean, I'm, I'm literally ahead of the curve on almost every trend that happens. Why? Because I'm not focusing on the technicals. I'm focusing on what is actually driving pricing in the market. What are the things that are actually making the numbers on the charts appear? And so my biggest thing, and this is my most controversial point of all, is that I think technical analysis is the biggest bunch of shit that was ever invented. The fact that you say that, should people actually study economics yes. and then start trading? Because Absolutely. that would make sense. If I know nothing about economics, it wouldn't make sense P to people, me. People are doing this the wrong way around. People are learning how to use a GPS right. and, then trying to, and then trying to drive a car. Right. You need to learn to drive the car first right. and then get the GPS. The, JP, the GPS is a support mechanism. So does Google Maps make it easier to navigate around? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But it's completely fucking useless to you if you don't know how to drive. And here's the problem. People don't know what is moving the market prices, which is fundamental economics. And that's why my market analysis every morning is so accurate because it's fundamental economics first, principles of fundamentals, and then it's technical analysis, which I only use technical analysis to help me make better entries, right? But having said that, my most fundamental, and again, another point of controversy, my most fundamental technical analysis doesn't involve any complex charting. It literally involves about seven or eight lines horizontally across the screen based on historical price movements on the charts. I pick up market points of interest 
and I know that the market will trade to those points of interest and then it will do something. And I have no idea what it's going to do. Everybody says, what's your prediction? I have no idea. If I have a general bias for the day, my bias will be that I'm going to choose a one, one directional trade. I'm going to be only taking sales today or only taking buys today. And then I wait for the market to go to these points of interest. Show me that it's actually going in the direction I want it to go and I trade with the market. I think people are overcomplicating all this technical analysis and indicators and all this bullshit. And I think it's become, I think it's become too easy to sell people on this idea that if they install an app, if they install an indicator, if they have the right chart set up, that they're going to be a successful trader. It's all bullshit. I think you have an advantage because a better part of your life you've been uh, a businessman, you've mm. been involved in investing. Yeah. And so it's almost second nature to you. But I do feel that there's somewhat of... <laughs> Sorry, I need <laughs> to make comfy. myself comfortable, yeah. I do feel like there's a little bit of instinct that comes into play because I've watched you. Yes. So yes. So that's almost an unfair advantage. <laughs> well, well, this is actually the thing that I'm, I'm struggling with in a way to impart to others. Yes, I've noticed. And so I'm able to teach people the market points of interest, how to trade, how to do technical analysis, understand the economics. But there is, a, there is an instinct for the way the market moves. And this is why I'm very big on people scalping aggressively in the early stages of their trading journey. Because if you scalp aggressively in your early part of your trading journey and you stick to a single asset, gold, US dollar, you stick to a single lot size, 0.01 .01 is what I recommend people start on, and you only trade that asset and you only trade that lot size, you will start to develop an instinct for the way the market moves, right? And so the way I think about this in my head is if you're a surfer mm. and you go sit out in the waves, an experienced surfer will always know where to paddle when the wave is coming to catch it at the right time. Mm. An inexperienced surfer will paddle around all day and catch no waves because they didn't know how to pick up the momentum of the wave. They haven't yet learned to read the waves. And trading is exactly the same way. You've got to learn to read when there's momentum and it comes in waves. You know, momentum is, is more aggressive at some times and less aggressive at other times. Trading is exactly like surfing in many ways because you've, you've got to read that momentum. There's big waves, there's small waves. You know, the peak of the wave is here, the, the, the end of the timing. wave is there, the timing. And so this is the thing that I'm really battling to say to somebody, here's a rule set, go and follow it. So what I am very big on, and this is why we started this demo trading competition inside the Money Tribe, is to teach people how to trade a single asset on a small lot size and find the momentum of the market. Because if you trade the same asset at the same lot size every single day, you will see on some days the market's moving faster than other days. You'll see that at certain times of the day the market moves faster than other days. You'll also see where the market is playing out support and resistance and you will start to develop that instinct, right? But then there's a deeper instinct and that deeper instinct I think also comes with experience. I think when you have been an investor or you may be a little bit older and you've been around the market cycles a little bit, you, you'll understand that, it was a beautiful saying, I think it was Hugh Jackman that said it, this too shall pass, right? The markets come to a high, this too shall pass. The markets at a low, this too shall pass, right? Mm. The market is constantly gonna move. And so I'm almost now at a point where I'm instinctively knowing when the market will turn. When, I, when it gets to a certain price point, I know that it's been resisting there. I looked at the history on it. I also understand what is happening in the world. And there's just this, this instinct that develops, almost like a, like, a, like a ball player. If you kick balls enough time through the post a million times in a row, you, you just, you, you, it, becomes it becomes a natural reflex. Mm. And I would say you're 100% right. I'm, I'm trading a lot more on, on an instinctive reflex these days but combined with a very strict rule system. Those rule systems keep me very honest in my trades. Because the problem is, a lot of people will think they've got the instinct and they start trading on, I feel like, or I think the market is gonna do this. And if you don't have rules in place, you, you're gonna get burnt. But how do you keep your emotions out of it? That's, I mean, I'm gonna ask you this every single time we record because so many people get that wrong. I don't, I don't think you can successfully start out as a trader and not have emotions. Yes. You are going to have emotions. I think it's like any traumatic event. You, mm. need to, you need to go through so much trauma and pain that you develop a level of tolerance 
for certain things, right? And so, you know, if you take a soldier who goes to war every day, that soldier is going to have a lot more tolerance for bombs dropping around him or her than, say, for example, somebody who just lands up in a war zone for the first time. You've got to put yourself in the heat of the battle. You've got, to, you've got to take the pain. You've got to take the losses. You've got to take the lessons. And I think this is why when they talk about the trader's journey, they say that the average trader, it'll take them no less than four years to become successful and just start breaking even, right? I'm a unicorn. I, the industry has already yes. told me this. Every person I've spoken to, the people that I work with on the, on the funded platforms, the institutional money that I'm trading, they all say you're a unicorn. Somebody like you comes along once every couple of decades. I literally slid in from complete novice and beginner straight into profits. That is not normal, right? Um, and I can understand why people have to go through that journey because you only develop tolerance through pain. And controlling your emotions is about tolerance. Mm. Not taking stupid 50-50 trades, or not going against your rule set. That's about developing tolerance. But trauma creates the tolerance. You've got to lose some money. Do you think you can build the tolerance on a demo account? Well, absolutely. And so that's, I don't think most people will do it because they'll go and open up a thousand or 10,000 demo accounts and it's not real. So we've created a simulator trading environment within the money tribe. And that's why we're running these demo trading competitions. You can start with hundred dollars. You're not allowed more than 5% drawdown. If you have more than 5% drawdown, you're kicked out of the competition, right? And that starts to simulate that, that high pressure environment, almost like it's real money. Plus you're competing against other people. So that drives all the other additional elements like fear of missing out, greed, you know, jealousy, like all these things. And so I think that we are probably inside the money tribe getting very close to what I call probably an honest simulated environment. And I have a lot of plans to develop that further because I think it is heartbreaking that it takes most people four years just mm -hmm. to get to a point where they are breaking even. I want to turn out profitable traders, not within months. I want to do it within weeks. I want to teach people rule sets. I want them to examine their own insecurities and inadequacies emotionally that let them make the wrong decisions and very quickly through simulation, get them to an environment where they can be profitable, not on large sums of money, on small sums of money, learn to be consistent and then add capital thereafter. What is market sentiment? And how does it affect trading? Market sentiment is just people's opinions, right? Opinions. And so you know, I, I like to say uh, uh, opinions are like assholes. Everyone's got one. <laughs> okay. I, I, I don't pay attention to sentiment in general. Like when you read news headlines, you're, you're essentially reading sentiment. That's what sentiment is. So part of my sentiment check in the morning is I will check the news headlines. I will see what the news headlines are saying. And I'll kind of gauge the market is sort of consolidating, it's bullish, it's bearish. That's my sentiment check. And sentiment really is a big driver in terms of pricing. So I'll give, you a, I'll give you an example in traditional stock investing, which will make a lot more sense. When a company lists an IPO on the stock exchange, they can list an IPO without making any money. They can do it just for raising capital. And... People can love the idea, love the business, and they can pump the stock price. And sentiment is driving that stock price because the company's not making any money, right? So it's got a very positive sentiment and it's based on, the pricing is based on excessively positive sentiment. So it's like popularity. It's popularity. Okay. And conversely, so you could have a company that lists that's making a lot of money and they have, they have no positive sentiment behind them and their stock price does nothing. And so... The reason why I say I'm not so focused on sentiment, because sentiment is always a short-term move, right? When you look at the fundamentals, what is that thing actually worth? What is the real world conditions that are driving pricing on this? When you, when you weight it down to economic factors, which comes back down to tangibly quantifiable numbers, you can then value the thing. So right. like what the business is actually doing and earning. Correct. So I can't control people's sentiment. Right. Okay. And I have no way of knowing if that sentiment is going to remain high or it's going to drop down to low. So I don't trade on sentiment. Sentiment is, sentiment is the one way that people will lose money. 
And most people investing, doesn't matter whether it's Forex, whether it's long-term investing, they invest based on sentiment of what other people are expressing rather than doing the hard work themselves by actually going and learning how to value the things that they're investing into. But I think that's also a lack of education because there are a lot of courses that people will take that don't explain this to them. I don't think so. I think it's laziness. Um, but what you don't know what you don't know. No, I think it's laziness. I think if you go and buy a car, if I say to you go buy a car, you're not a car person. No. You're going to go read every car review. You're going you're gonna, to you're gonna make sure that that decision that you're making of that 200 grand investment, mm. investment, you're going you're gonna to know everything there is to know about that car. I mean, I see you do it over dresses. You, you read, I see, I see you do it over face products. You spend an inordinate amount of time researching face products, right? But you won't go and spend the same amount of time and due diligence on a financial product. Mm. The average person is lazy. It's not because there isn't information out there. And with the, the internet being at, at everybody's disposal, it's a simple Google search away to figure things out. I've still got now today in 2024, people sending me messages saying, what do you think of this investment? What do you think of that investment? It takes me one Google search to see it's a pyramid scheme. Okay. So I think it's pure laziness. Yeah, I think nice. people don't want to do the work. And it, and it breaks my brain because I don't understand. We're working so hard for money. We're working so hard to get that money. And then people don't do the work. I, it just, it, I, it's laziness. Maybe it's because it's it can be compared to gambling in a way. So I think people... What can be compared? For trading. It, trading. <laughs> trading. Because, you know, you press a button and some people it's, think, you know, I can press a button and take a chance. Maybe that's why they're so lazy because every time they press that button, they've got to fight their greed or their fear or they I, have to do research. I totally disagree. People, people will go and invest with a broker and never check the underlying asset that the broker is putting the money into on their behalf. I know people who have been investing with brokers for 20 years. You're talking about a trading broker? No, right? no, in, a broker. investment broker. Right, okay. They've been investing with that broker for 20 years, buying a retirement annuity, buying some kind of stock shares, whatever it is. Mm. I need to figure out 25 years later, the broker never invested in the actual asset, has been scooping their money for 20 plus years. It happens all the time. I get these messages almost on a weekly basis. My broker did me in. No, sir. No, ma'am. The broker didn't do you in. You didn't ask questions when you handed over the money. You're the lazy one, right? And so why is Forex a gamble for some people and for other people it's, a, it's an absolute fucking science and they're making money out of it? It's not, the, the problem isn't, isn't Forex. The problem isn't that it's gambling. The problem is that the individual is gambling. The individual didn't do the work and therefore, when they pushed the buy and sell button, they were taking a gamble, right? It's not because it's seen as gambling. The person is gambling, right? You know, gun, guns don't kill people. People kill people. Mm. The forex market does not lose money if you do the work, right? Mm. If you do the work, you, you're going to be on the right side of the movement. But people are just lazy. They don't want to put in the work. They don't want to put in the time. They want the shortest path to profits, which is why there's been this prolification of forex robots and signal sellers and people don't want to do the work and i think when people are cut for when they're tired and 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 they are frustrated with losing money they're going to eventually come to somebody like me inside the money mm. shop and then they're going to learn the basic fundamental principles of a money and b economics and three themselves and once they've learned those three things they will then become profitable traders so what if um, I take a bad trade and I'm a beginner and I'm stuck in this bad trade? What would you recommend I do? Close it. Lose. Do you know that's hard for people to do? Lose. <laughs> you don't turn losing trades into winning trades. There's nothing that you can do mm. that will turn a losing trade into a winning trade. It's outside of your control. There's no magic. There's no amount of praying. There's no amount of throwing salt in the corners of your house. <laughs> There's, 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 there's no amount of witchcraft that is going to turn that trade around. You have to understand that if you took a shit trade, the best thing you can do is close that trade. Even if it lands up going in the direction you eventually intended it to go into. And you go, oh, well, shit, I closed the trade and I could have made money. Mm. Let me tell you the problem with that. Mm. The problem with that is going to breed the same attitude the next time you take a trade. Well, it might work out. Right. We don't take trades based on it might work out. I am like a surgeon. I don't, this is, this is not like a, like a field doctor where I grab a blunt knife and just hope to cut you in the right place. 
I'm doing, I'm doing brain surgery. I'm doing heart surgery. One wrong move and I lose. That's the way I trade. You know, when you put it like that, that is exactly why I'm, I'm not interested in trading. But if you knew the rules? <sighs> Maybe. If you were taught the, the, the skill set to examine your own shortcomings emotionally and grow as a person and elevate to a higher level of thinking, spirituality and emotional intelligence to be able to make the right decisions, you'd feel unstoppable. You'd feel, you'd feel like the world is at your feet. That's how I feel. That's, those are the traders I'm turning out. I am, I am spiritually uplifted and <laughs> enlightened already. Well, it's the other when it stuff. comes to skin cream. It's the, <laughs> <laughs> it's the other stuff I need help with, the economics of it all. If you want to become the best version of yourself and achieve financial freedom, join Money Tribe 21 and be part of a like-minded community. Not only will you have access to Justin Harrison's highly acclaimed Forex course, you will also join hundreds of people who have changed their lives through groundbreaking business, investing in personal development content. Share your progress and have all your questions answered in real time on the Money Tribe app, where members have direct access to the Money Tribe team. Join the Money Tribe could be the best thing that you've ever done. I've not had a negative day yet. Double my demo account. It's practical. Let's keep making profits and making money. Incredible wealth structure. This is the best investment that you will ever make in yourself. Don't think about it. Just get it. It's worth it. Visit MoneyTribe21.com for more. You post every day. You're making money. And um, you're also selling Forex courses, you know. And then they say in the comments, I don't blame you guys for saying this. Why are you selling courses if you're making so much money? So maybe you can clear that up. We actually got this question in the live a couple of days ago. And listen, I, I say this to people all the time. I am doing the worst job in the world of selling Forex <laughs> courses <You are. laughs> and, and, selling, and selling the Money Tribe, right? Money Tribe members come up to me all the time and say to me, People don't know what you're offering. Until they get in there, they don't know what you're offering. That's why we hardly have people exit the money tribe. When people join the money tribe and they've gone through a bit of the content, they stay. Most of our, most of our members stick around. We've had members who've now been there with us from day one that we launched and haven't left, right? The majority of people. So I, I gotta say, I do a pretty shitty job of selling the money tribe. I, if anybody thinks I'm selling to them, you obviously have never experienced salesmanship. I need, I, I need to obviously exercise some, some salesmanship voodoo and show you what selling is. The reason why I have a watermark on all of my videos, which directs people to my web address, is because I got so tired of the scammers out there cloning my profile, taking my videos, putting them on their profiles, and then getting people to go to their link and sign up for some bullshit crypto forex investment where people are handing over money to these scammers. And I was like, you know what, if people are gonna, if people are gonna clone my videos and take them and put them out on social media, it's gonna have my watermark on so I can direct people mm. to a website where I can actually help them, which leads into the deeper reasoning. The reason why I'm committed to helping people, and I don't need to do this, I genuinely don't need to do this. I would be done by 11 o'clock most days, sitting tanning my balls on the beach, if, if, if I wasn't helping people, right? I, I want to make a difference because I grew up poor. I know what it means to go without. I know what it means to sleep on the street. I know what it means to have a lack of opportunity. I know what it means to have your dignity removed when you have no money. I'm not saying people should measure themselves by how much money they have in their bank account, but when you have had every cent in your pocket removed from you, I will tell you that money is important. Mm. The person who's got a little bit of money in their pocket and says, oh, money's not important because they've fucking never been at a place where they haven't had any, right? When you can't afford to go to hospital, when you can't afford to buy yourself a plate of food, I've eaten out of dumpsters. I know what it means to be hungry. And so I want to help people because there are people out there who just are looking for that break. They're looking for that opportunity. They're looking for that something that doesn't care about their age, doesn't care about their gender, doesn't care about their opinions, doesn't care with people like them or dislikes them this is forex i believe is the single greatest catalyst for changing people's lives if taught correctly mm. and so i started the money tribe first and foremost to leave a legacy for my children i wanted that if i drop dead tomorrow and we've spoken about this a lot i've been through fucking hell to know what i know and not 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 like oh, i've had a hard time 
No, no, I've been through fucking hell. I've, I've crawled over broken glass to know what I know. I, I used to go to libraries in America where I could get books for free for the, for the couple of hours and just glean whatever information. I, I used to go and get mentored by people. I begged, I pleaded, I put myself in situations, I networked. I did, I did everything you can imagine to gain this knowledge, right? And I've sacrificed financially, I've sacrificed my health, I've sacrificed everything to know what I know. This is, this is not some shit I read in a book. This is my life. What I teach is my life. And I didn't want that knowledge to die with me. That's why I created The Money Chop. I felt it was imperative that I leave it for our three children that if I die, there is a record of something that they can follow when I'm no longer around that they can know how to make money, how to hold on to the money, and how to not be a slave to governments, to employment, and to money. And part of that is if I want to leave this world behind for my children, I've got to try and make a difference. I have to try and make a difference. How can I comfortably sit on this side of the fence and, and live with such freedom while there are people around suffering and not try and help? People don't even know why I'm making this money. People don't even know why I'm making and this don't money. Have to tell them. And I'm not going to. <laughs> but people don't even know why I'm making this money. This money's not for me. People don't even understand that. People think I'm trading. People, when somebody said to me the other day, why are you, why, why are you still trading? You, you've made enough money. When someone said to me, why are you charging for your courses? You've made enough money. It's greed. People have no idea what this money is being used for, right? Mm. And so. I genuinely want to be an instrument for change. I genuinely want to help people. I think the old, the old ways of making money are dead. I think the old ways of creating generational wealth are dead. I think families are broken, and families are broken because of economic principles that have destroyed the, the core cluster of the home. The, 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 the matriarchy and patriarchy in the home has been broken down because of economics. And I want to give people the economic hand back and say, Here's a chance to make money. Figure out how to use this and build your family. So that your family, even if you don't taste freedom, your children will taste freedom. Because I can tell you in my lifetime, this is the first time in my life I've ever tasted freedom. Mm. I've made a shitload of money. And this is the first time I've made money that I've tasted freedom. Because all the other money I had to work my ass off for. I had to kill myself for that money. This money is the easiest money I've ever made. The only hard part is me. It is me against the market. And I want to give people that opportunity. Is everybody going to be a successful trader? No. Is everybody going to be a successful investor? No. Are some people going to have to go back to their shitty jobs and flip the burgers and clean my toilet? Absolutely. Darwin said it best. There is a natural order to life. Mm. And if it's not your time, it's not your time. Peace and blessings unto you. It may be in your next lifetime. It's so different to so many other interviews I've heard and we've watched together because so many other people offering a course or something, that's not their answer. The answer is always something very technical, like I want to give people skills so that they can trade. Basically, that's what the answer is. So your answer is so deep and meaningful um, compared to what's out there. And what you're offering is also deep and meaningful. I think people assume that Money Tribe is just a Forex course which it is not. It is a complete lifestyle shift from your mentality to your body, to your health, to fixing yourself. And Forex is last. Forex came long after we've been teaching the core principles of wealth creation and fixing yourself as a human being. Five years ago. Yeah. Five years ago you started this. Forex has only come now. And people are coming for the Forex. But they are staying for the value you've added behind it. Yep. Why do you want your community to succeed? Because you mentioned those words. I want my community to succeed. My, my community is my family. My community is people who've come together who said we want freedom. They want to taste freedom. My community is a bunch of people who've had enough of the traditional way of doing things, tired of being slaves, tired of not having time for their families, tired of not having a life, tired of simply working to pay taxes and die. Mm. And I want freedom for my community because I want freedom for my family. And if I am leaving this world with three beautiful children behind, 
I have to do everything in my power to leave a better community. I have to do everything in my power to leave a legacy. I've got to do everything in my power to make change. I've got to do everything in my power to leave them surrounded by people who have grown up with a similar value system as us. And I didn't grow up with that value system, something I developed, we won't say us, our family. Mm. And we are all part of this ecosystem. We are all part of this environment, whether we like it or dislike it. And the reason why I called it money tribe is because we are a tribe. We are a tribe of different colors, different ages, different religions, different groups. But we all come down with one single thing. We all want freedom for our families. Mm. That's what we want. We want freedom for our families. And I, I want to help people achieve freedom. I want people to know what it feels like to be free. I've suffered the indignity of not being free. And I, I want people to taste what I've got. But first and foremost, I, I want my family to have freedom. And I can't expect them to be free in a world and be surrounded by other people who are enslaved and feel free. You're only free when you're amongst other free thinkers. Yeah, I agree with you. That's quite deep. How do I find out if a broker is, a, is an A book or B book broker? And can you tell me the difference between the two? Okay, so very simple. A book broker, money that you put in with a broker goes through an upstream liquidity provider. The trade actually gets put into the market. B book broker, your money never goes to the market. It sits with the broker and it's kind of like betting at the casino. When you lose, you lose to the casino. When you lose on a B-Book broker, you lose to the broker. There's, it's mostly negative reasons uh, to have a B-Book broker. There's not a lot of positive. Um, so I would always recommend having an A-Book broker. How do you find out? First and foremost, ask them, right? They, they are, especially if they regulate it, if they tell you they're an A-Book broker and they're actually a B-Book broker and you find out later, there's serious repercussions for them. So you should get in writing. I'm get in writing. So okay. I do that anytime I look at using a new broker. I interview them. I have a discussion with them over email or on live chat. I screenshot everything. I keep it as part of my broker folder as part of a historical reference. And then the other thing is just do a Google search mm. again. Is broker X an A book or a B book broker? Mm. And you will very soon find out. So um, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not saying any, I'm not accusing anyone, but is it safe to say a B-Book broker is closer to a scam? No, no, or... they're, not, they're not necessarily a scam, although okay. most of them are. Okay, so there are, there are exceptions to it, but most There of... are exceptions, but most of them are scams. Okay. <laughs> you didn't say it. I, I just asked. No, no, I'll say, I'll say it happily. Okay. Most B-Book brokers are a scam. You're not attacking any B-Book brokers. But there are some good the... B-Book yes, brokers out yes. there. So I'll give you an example. There are some B-Book brokers that I will trade because they bet on execution times during high news events. Can you name one so we don't tell no. everyone? Someone wanted to know if your courses are beginner friendly. My courses are suitable for a complete novice, somebody who's never touched the market before. If you were... Me. If you were a housewife <laughs> buying face creams and you wanted to learn about <laughs> forex trading, this is the course for you. If you are an intermediate trader or maybe you've got a little bit of experience, but you haven't yet achieved profitability, you absolutely need to do this course. Don't be a snob and think because you know what a Fibonacci retracement tool is that you know how to trade. The way you measure whether you can trade or not, how much money are you making? Have you made more money than you've lost? If the answer is yes, I've made more money than I've lost, don't take my course. Keep doing what you're doing. Stick with what you know. Don't strategy hop. Keep doing the thing you're doing. Mm. But if you're hopping around looking for the holy grail trading strategy, I'm not your guy, right? Mm. I'm here to teach you how to trade like an institutional trader. I'm here to teach you the fundamental principles of what the market is. I'm here to teach you how to execute consistently profitable trades. I'm here to teach you that it is not about the trade setup, it is about the trader. And I'm gonna teach you how to be a better trader. From complete beginner to experienced people, if you are not making profit, this course is for you. And a lot of people ask how much they need to start with money-wise. Zero. Always ask. Zero. Zero. Okay. You should never put money in the market until you can consistently take a $100 demo account and make 2% per day. That does sound easy though. Yeah. $2 a day, how long do you think it'll take you to get to three, eight, four hundred dollars $400? A long time. 
And that's why I say to people, if you can do that consistently, because it will take most people six months to a year to do that, then you put real money in. Until then, don't put your money in. You're going to lose. This is a patience game. No, this is a game of discipline. Patience comes after the discipline. The discipline comes first. Are you a top-down trader or do you focus on smaller times? I don't know what that means, so maybe you can explain. Uh, it's these technical people, right? Because okay. it's all in the charts, guys. It has nothing to do with the real-world market conditions. I'm being super sarcastic because I'm so tired of these same stupid questions. So what what time mean? frame do you trade? What, what, do you analyze the charts top-down or, or, or bottom-up? So guys, I do it any way I want. Sometimes I'll do it bottom up, sometimes I'll do it top down. Generally speaking, on entry, I'll take my entries in the five minute chart, but I'll look up at my higher time frames for reasons to not take that trade. If I'm analyzing the, the markets at the beginning of the day, I look bottom down, a uh, top down. Also, I look at the monthly, the weekly, the daily, the four hour, the one hour, and maybe peek in at the five minute, right? I look top down to get a picture of the market for the day right so the larger picture but when i'm taking entries i'm looking here's my entry but is there anything up here that might cause me not to take this trade it is so stupid it's because people are using this terminology but they have fucking no idea about what moves the market go do some economics first go go to go to the bookstore get economics for dummies Okay, right? I'm Read the <laughs> economics for dummies, understand supply demand economics, yeah. then let's have this discussion. But you guys are learning to read the GPS, but you don't know how to drive the fucking car. When it comes to trend trading slash scalping, what are the three main confluences or most reliable ones to use? I'm currently using RSI candles and patterns. Yeah, you're ignoring the biggest one of all. The three moving averages if you're above the three moving averages you're trading up if you're below the three moving averages you're trading down you should never trade anywhere in between those moving averages don't trade between the moving averages you're going to get caught in consolidation so you can look at all your patterns all your rsis you can look at all that shit. but at the end of the day you're ignoring the larger trend if you want to trade buy positions Wait for it to be above the three moving averages. That's your first confluence. And then find two additional confluences. Could be an RSI above 50. And it could be some kind of bullish pattern trend. Right? Um, and the converse is true to the downside. Okay. How do you analyze correlations between forex markets and other asset classes? And what insights have you gained from them? Everything in the world going to shit. Good for gold. <laughs> Right, that one we know today. Really simple. Really simple. That's it. Property is property is failing miserably. Real estate is dumping. Buy gold. Right? Bond markets, US dollars tanking, currencies are tanking, buy gold. It's really that simple, right? <laughs> like we don't need to overcomplicate the shit. Okay. Just buy gold. Okay. No? There are times to sell. Okay, tell us when you sell. I sell when... When everything's going well. I sell oh, when goodness. the market is overbought. That means there are more buyers in the market than there are sellers. And those buyers have been exhausted to the point where supply and demand no longer makes sense. Right? The, the, the demand has completely outstripped supply. That means eventually... Free market economics need to bring supply and demand together. And it's what we refer to. And God, there's going to be somebody who, who when I say this, there's going to be somebody who brings up an ICT concept. Guys, I'm not an ICT trader. Okay. When there's a state of equilibrium in the market. So ICT guys love this word. It's also known as the fair market value. They will meet each other. And we'll buy an economics for dummies book. <laughs> if we don't know what that means. Yeah. Okay, so our family runs on a calendar and a schedule. And on that calendar, every first Friday, there's a big red NFP. And on that Friday, we know dad's not available between 2 o'clock to half past 2. No, half past 3. Half past 3. Sorry, I thought it was half past 2. I need to go and read that again. <laughs> You're in the wrong time zone. 
<laughs> GMT plus two. Yeah. Right. Dad now wants to know what is NFP for dummies and why does it affect trading? What does it have to do with trading? So NFP is basically non-farm payrolls in America. And it's an indication of all the job growth or job losses in the US economic setup outside of basically your your core government workers your basically your your they could they call them farm workers basically it's basically anybody who's not in the on the private payroll right and if there's if if there's jobs growth in the u.s economy that means so if the nfp data shows job growth rate that means it's good for the u.s economy if it's good for the u.s economy it's generally bad for gold right why because if I've got money, I'd rather put it into something in the US, whether it's companies, stocks, dollars itself in the bank, because it's earning interest, right? And so generally speaking, I'll take my money out of a non-interest bearing asset like gold, and I'll transfer it into an interest bearing asset like something US dollar denominated, right? Mm -hmm. On the flip side, if the, data, if the data is bad and there's severe job losses and things are not looking great in the US economy, that's going to push up gold because people are going to gold for the safe haven. So NFP happens on the first Friday of every month. It is a reflection back on basically jobs growth data. Um, and there's always a forecast and a prediction, but they're hardly ever accurate. And if that data it varies a lot, it can move the pricing on market open more aggressively than any other point. The, uh, the ones that move market is NFP, FOMC, PPI, and CPI. Those are, those are the big ones. There are a couple of other ones, but those are the big ones. Um, and I personally don't trade the news events. I want to make this very clear. I don't promote gambling. I don't promote trading in front of the news. I want the news to happen, and I always catch the move after the news. Because otherwise, it's a 50-50 gamble. There are times when I will trade ahead of the news. But very rare. If I am following the economic data in the build-up, and I believe very strongly, for example, that the U.S. economy is declining, and I strongly believe that the dollar is going to decline, and I have an absolute concrete belief in the 80 percentile that that's what's going to happen, I will take that trade. But I generally don't take that trade. Till after the news. Till after. Right. I'll rather pick up one third of the movement in the right direction than 100% of the move in the wrong direction. It's like going to the casino and playing roulette, saying black or red. That's what I do. <laughs> exactly what I do, which, I don't, which is I, exactly why I I don't take 50-50s. I don't take 50-50s. When I trade, I know where the trade is going. But I mean, if you're trading and you're serious about your trading, you shouldn't be doing that. But, but that begs into question, right? The people promoting this kind of activity, Yeah. All I'm saying to people out there is really go ask yourself the deeper question, why? And I'm not saying there are not people out there that who don't successfully trade. Because there's strategies, right? You can just put a big purse together and you can say, we're going to trade 12 NFPs in the next year. And if I win six of them, I'm ahead. If I win five of them, I'm ahead, right? But the problem is the average person is going to cripple themselves financially. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Please remember to subscribe, to follow to share and drop some comments. The last video, we could have had more comments. We Please don't. comment or else Justin's not coming back. If you want a question answered, put it down below. Should we go get some cheesecake? Mm -mm. Can we go? You mean, can we go without the cheesecake? Yes, but you can have something downstairs quickly. Come on, there might be a nice little quiche piche. <laughs>